Artery recordings. Hey guys, how's it going? This is Shan Dan from Artery Recordings doing another video blog. Um, today I am talking with Dan Surf, uh, who's done a billion things. He uh, works at Mercenary Management, uh, manages Black Veil Brides, Black Label Society, Cold Chamber, and a billion other bands that are fucking huge. Um, he also has a past working at Sumerian Records for, uh, what was it, Dan? About four years plus? Four years. Nice, nice. <laughs> Well, what, what else are you working on? I know you guys got your hands on some Star Wars, big branding stuff. And... Oh, yeah. I mean, our our parent company, the Rocket Group, uh, which handles all the production and merchandising for big name like Broadway productions like Wicked, um, we, they just started doing the merchandising for Star Wars, um, what, episode eight or seven? Is that is episode. that a TV show? I've never heard of that. So, sorry. You know what? Sorry, I knew the answer to that. Star Wars Episode Seven. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know, um, some of the other clients, like on the parent group, is uh, like Marvel, Playboy, cool things, and then with Mercenary, you know, the bands you mentioned, and then Butcher Babies and Drama Club and Devil Driver, and now Wild Audio, Zach Wild's uh, like guitar company. That's awesome, man. Yeah, you guys are killing it. Definitely uh, have your hands in a lot of the up upcoming or not even upcoming already successful, you know, bands that are making a lot of uh, noise. And uh, you know, that kind of brings us to our first question, which is, uh, you know, to get to that point of of being a band that's successful, that's kind of got their hands in everything that that uh, you know is being successful. They had to have made the right moves in their career path, and that is either through their own ideas or having a manager that kind of steers them in the right direction. So maybe what uh, we could talk about today is uh, successful bands versus failure bands. Like what makes a career kind of climb versus what you can kind of do to maybe damage your growth, you know? So um, I guess let's start like, uh, what are some successful moves? You know, let's say even a, a small local band could start doing to maybe step into the realm of bands that you work with. You know, I think, most importantly would have to be the work ethic you know you'd need to sit there you'd have to create good compelling songs that would resonate with your audience even on the local level you know you don't need to be like a you don't need a huge producer like a you know a joey sturgis or a john feldman or whatever to make a good clean sounding song but you need something that's going to resonate with your audience and you need to be able to push and get it you know to people's ears and now when i say work ethic I'm, I mean more than just going on Facebook or Twitter and, you know, grinding people to check out your song. Um, what I see, unfortunately, a lot of right now is just a lack of involvement at the guerrilla level. I very rarely see, you know, up and coming metal bands or any kind of band walk up to me and hand me a flyer for their show. Mm -hmm. And I go to at least one local show a week and I have been for the past almost seven years, you know, but very rarely does, do I get that level of engagement from these up and coming musicians they think just kind of the face a facebook post or whatever is going to be enough to reel me in and it's not um and i think you know that would probably be the major aspect of work ethic is getting out there and talking to people um and that'd be that's the one thing that really separates like a black veil brides from some of the other emerging artists i've worked with in the past or i've seen like these guys are some of the hardest workers I've, I've ever met. You know, the first time I met Andy, he was at a show flyering people to come out to, to see Black Veil Brides, you know? You know, it's funny, actually, the first time I met him was in this real seedy bar. They were they were touring, you know, uh, this is before they even released an album, <laughs> stuff like that, or maybe they just released it and it was to maybe 20 kids, you know, and uh, they, they rocked out and they met everybody and, you know, got their hands dirty, and then now here they are playing huge venues, you know, worldwide. It's awesome, man. Right. Yeah, and, you know, like, they – and I want to use them as an example because it's – and, you know, like, you've, you've seen it as well. They start out at the local level, and they were the champions of their local mm -hmm. scene and slowly just spread across, you know, the U.S. and then North America, and now, you know, they're one of the biggest bands in the U.K., mm -hmm. um, and I, I really like what they did in terms of owning the local scene. They were the top band in Cincinnati. Then they became the top drawing, you know, local unsigned act in 
all of Ohio before the, you know, Andy even moved out to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And you see this a lot with, you know, even bands that we've worked with in our past, like Suicide Silence, were the kings of, you know, local metal and hardcore in Los Angeles. And it really showed in their career before they even got signed. They had a full sold out U.S. tour. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny, too, like, you know, when when I go to local shows, just like, you you know, I, I go often just kind of check stuff out, get out of the office and whatnot. And uh you know, I never tell anybody where I'm from, you know, just because, like, you you don't want to brag about something like that. But every now and then a band will hand you a flyer or CD like, hey, uh, listen to us, blah, blah, blah. And little did they know who they handed it to, you know, like, <laughs> right. you know, some of these metal bands that meet you, you know, and they're, they're like, hey, here's my, my demo. Check it out. You know, how how would they know that you're the manager of, you know, black okay. label society, you know, that they idolize? <laughs> right. But you know what? I appreciate that level of work ethic. You know, yeah. they, they're getting out there. They're putting they're, they're getting themselves in front of people. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much a, a blank CD costs, but it's probably like a dollar or so. Mm -hmm. It's a very low marketing budget. It's definitely less expensive handing out, you know, 500 CDs at like an, a not fest yeah. than, you know, s spending thousands of dollars on Facebook ads, yeah. get, you know, getting potential fans that you can't even reach. I mean, even even on Facebook, you know, with the uh, time span of of how long kids remember stuff, you know, like you post on Facebook, you do a promoted ad, like people forget about that in two days. Absolutely. You know, whereas like a CD, you know, that you handed to some kid, it's going to be on his desk or in his, the, you know, the the stereo in his car or something like that for a while. Um, but uh, you know, that's that's funny. I mean, also like I don't know if you've seen this, you know, in, in local bands or smaller bands, but the thing that drives me crazy is when you know, a brand new band is touring. They're in, they're in their van, and they won't even post on Facebook. And I'm like, what are you doing? You got so much spare time <laughs> on the road. And maybe this relates to one of the failure moves. You know, if if you're going to be a successful band, you should probably every spare moment you have be promoting in some capacity, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you know, and that that goes back to you know the work ethic. Um, I think if you're on tour, let's keep it real. Everyone's got a smartphone. Take mm -hmm. some videos if you're really at that local level and you're having a difficult time drawing, you know, 20 or even or 20 to 50 people to your shows. Um, I, I personally don't think you should be touring. I think you should be focusing on upping your local game. But if you do decide to go on tour, there's nothing stopping you from recording all of your performances, putting them up on YouTube, or even just sitting there and critiquing them afterwards so you can, you know, figure out how to make your performance better. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. There's absolutely no reason anybody on tour should be sitting around, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, unless you're like the Black Sabbath level and you don't need to do anything but get up on stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, the majority of the artists, even the ones I work with um, and you work with also, mm -hmm. they're not at that level. They always need to be working. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it takes so little effort to post something on Instagram, to post a 15 second video or whatever. Yeah. There's no reason it shouldn't be getting done. Absolutely. And I mean, there's there's two types of bands that I've, I've dealt with. You know, it's the bands that are open minded and they say, uh, hey, what can we do? You know, what what do you need from us? Like what what can be working on? What can we work on right now that's going to help help you guys you know, develop us or push out the album? And then there's the other band that's like, we're signed now. So it's your problem. You know, we're, we're going to go and get drunk and just be in a van and play video <laughs> games. You know, Right. I, and, you know, that's something we've seen all too often. But you know the the struggle really begins after you get signed yeah. because now you owe now you owe some corporation a whole lot of money yeah, and yeah. You figure out ways to recoup it um and plus like your your first week sales like if you get signed you're not you know you're not guaranteed to sell records so you know the big killer too is like when your album comes out if it sells a lot that paves the way for bigger opportunities but if it tanks then you're kind of shot you know a lot of times oh, absolutely if you're an emerging artist and you know you you do get that dream record deal, and you know your first week sales aren't there or your overall sales aren't there. You're going to get dropped, and you know, and, and I don't want to put any artists on blast. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a lot of respect for all musicians, but you know, a simple Google search will show it happens very frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just at the major label level; it's at the independent and even bedroom label level where if they don't think they're going to see a return on their investment your band's going to get axed. Yeah. And that all goes back to, you know, 
working hard. How are you going to put your music in front of people? How are you going to put yourself in front of people? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but so, <laughs> sorry, I, I was thinking, um, what came to mind of, you know, a successful tactic of a cool band and go, going back to one of your previous vlogs about how to get signed, um, my friend from Prosthetic Records was recently telling me the story of how a band sent her record label um, demos and uh, delivered a pizza with it. Yeah, you know, brilliant. It immediately, brilliant. It, yeah. it immediately got everyone's attention. And, you know, lucky for them, the music was really good. But that just goes to show, like, they put time into their music, they put time into their presentation, and they immediately got a record label executive's attention. Yeah, yeah. They thought outside of the box. And, like, even even weirder, like, you know, and you know my past. I, I worked at Century Media for four years. And in the four years, not once did a band actually show up to the label, which, you know, I, I thought, you know, for sure some kid would try a gimmick and, you know, play out in the parking lot or like something crazy or show up with a <laughs> in a costume like a banana or some shit. Who knows? You know, there's tons of stuff, but never happened in four years. Um, <laughs> no, that's really funny. I'm, I'm really surprised no one thought of the idea of performing a show in the CM parking lot. Yeah. Which would have been awesome. Oh, um, for sure. You know, I... And I, and I like to talk about successful like band habits. I did get some really cool submissions during my time at Sumerian Records. Um, and, you know, they would they would send these packages with a promo photo, their hype sheet, um, detailed information, and then one band in particular that I actually became really good friends with sent over testimonials from existing Sumerian bands that they had played with. Nice. So, talking up the band. They sent ticket counts, um, their merch numbers, everything I would need to be able to judge a band and see you know, how they run their business, how serious they were. And they were absolutely serious about being a professional touring band. Okay. And it, it showed in the amount of effort they put in. And you know, even their letter to the company was personalized to Sumerian Records. You know, to myself, to the head of A&R, to the label owner. Yeah, it wasn't um, a copy-paste situation. Yeah, it's not a copy-paste. It was personalized. Like, they wanted it. Um, although Samaria didn't pick them up, I was very happy to see they got picked up by another, you know, one of the bigger uh, metal record labels mm -hmm. that they're currently doing successful at. That's or, awesome. Yeah. I got a, uh, a demo submitted to me that was in a piece of paper. It was, like, just white paper. And they stapled it into an envelope because they did, apparently they could, couldn't buy an envelope. <laughs> and uh, it was just handwritten all over it, their lyrics in pen, like on lined sheet paper. And it was all this effort. Like they didn't know how to use a printer or something or how to type on a computer. And then I opened this stapled thing with just, it looks like just the rantings of a lunatic, you know, <laughs> hand drawn. And it's it's got a blank CD. And I'm like, God, I got to hear this. This is going to be crazy. Put it in. It's blank. They didn't burn it properly. So after writing all of this effort, there wasn't music on the CD in the first place. You know, they forgot it. And that's that's probably a, a perfect example to end with, you know, a, a successful press kit or band versus right. somebody that's failing and probably shouldn't be sending out demos, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, at the, and it's something we don't like to say all too often, especially mm -hmm. publicly. But the reality is if you're trying to get signed, if you're trying to get picked up by a manager, booking agent you're turning your hobby into a job yeah. and you would never present poor quality work to your boss yeah absolutely you know? and so when you submit these demos and talk to these you know people from record labels and whatever you're essentially going on a job interview oh you know, for sure so you don't want to be that guy that you know botches it by doing something in, by doing something stupid or you didn't fully think out your plan yeah absolutely well um I guess that's a good note to uh, end on this one. Uh, but uh, yeah, my uh, guest, Dan Seraf, um, thanks for watching, guys. Um, once again, if you guys want to uh, keep watching these kind of things, subscribe. There should be a button up here. Um, if you have questions that uh, you'd like answered by industry professionals, just leave it in the comments of this video. Um, and then we'll you know, get a video down the line kind of answering that stuff. But uh, thanks for watching, guys. Um, and uh, tune in next time. Artery Recordings.